Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us this morning for the Loch Ness Monster Fact or Fiction with John Horrigan. We're joined by New England Emmy Award winning folklorist John Horrigan uh, to explore the legend of the Loch Ness Monster, a creature in Scottish folklore that is said to inhabit Loch Ness in the Scottish Highlands. The monster, which is sometimes referred to as Nessie, is often described as large, long necked, and with one or more humps protruding from the water. Popular interest and belief in the creature has varied since it was brought to worldwide attention in 1933. We're gonna learn whether Nessie is the real deal or a mysterious folklore creature of the deep. Uh, a little bit about John. I know John's gonna introduce himself, but uh, let me uh, spoil it just a little bit. Uh, John is the award-winning host and co-creator of the Folklorist uh, television series, which offered a captivating look at some of the lesser known occurrences in history. Uh, he's also a prolific professional sports announcer, narrator, historical researcher, and lecturer who has performed in over 2,500 venues across North America. So everyone uh, watching live here on Zoom and on Facebook and those that will watch uh, later on demand on YouTube, let's give a big virtual round of applause to John for joining us here this morning. And John, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robert. And uh, thank you so much for presenting these wonderful series. I guess this is the wrap up, the 12th of a dozen paranormal lectures. So I'm just honored to be here today and I'm honored here to be with you. Um, is it fact or fiction? It's faction. It depends on what day it is. I like to say, if you believe, I probably don't. If you don't believe, I probably do. Um, I believe that people have seen something. What they've seen, I don't know. Same goes for uh, strange creatures like Bigfoot or Mothman. But as Robert mentioned, I uh, hosted and wrote the uh, Folklorist. And I was very lucky to uh, receive five Boston, New England Emmy Awards and get 20 nominations. And you can find it on YouTube at www.folklorist.tv. As he said, a uh, professional sports announcer. I'm wrapping up my career over 30 years across North America. I've been working, I'm still working with the Boston Bruins alumni, but I work with the New England Patriots alumni, Boston Red Sox alumni, NHL. And recently this summer, I found out that I've been nominated for induction into the inaugural Comedy Basketball Hall of Fame. I'll let you know where they build the tool shed <laughs> so you can visit it. I love paranormal phenomena. Now that I've, uh, uh, I've, I'm on the downswing of my professional career, I can come out, so to speak, and look at all the research that I did in the early 1990s, because the two don't clash. Uh, people would think that I'm stranger than they already think I am. But I've been to Loch Ness, Roswell multiple times, Lake Champlain, Shag Harbor, Area 51, Gulf Breeze, San Luis Valley, Kecksburg, British Columbia, and the Pacific Northwest in search of alleged UFO encounters, UFO crashes, cattle mutilation, Bigfoot and sea serpents. And my wife and I hosted a mass monster mash and mass UFO show last decade for a few years. So I thank Robert for continually bringing me back. I explored and narrated a popular film by Aaron Kadju called The Bridgewater Triangle, and one recently by um, Alexander Petikoff, who spoke in the series Lions of the East. And I was the final person to interview Betty Hill, the legendary uh, abductee. You can find the lost Betty Hill interview on YouTube. So we'll look at what's a lock, what could it be, early sightings, encounters in the 1930s, the search, and then today. They're still encountering or claiming that they're encountering uh, the beastie today. A loch is an Irish or Scottish Gaelic word for a lake or a sea inlet. It can also be called a firth, an estuary, a fjord, strait, or bay. And in northern England, they're called mirrors. And they're used for transporting ships and barges to other large bodies of water via canals, where the locks are water levels are risen and drop manually, for instance, the Panama Canal. Of course, you can reference the image on the right here. It, it basically travels from the northeast to the southwest. It's the largest of three locks uh, located in the Great Glen, which divides the north of Scotland, along a line from Fort William to Inverness. Now, I saw in the chat session, Kathy's been there multiple times. I was there once in 1997, and me coming out of the uh, airport in Edinburgh <laughs> on the wrong side of the road and the wrong side of the car, I almost got into an accident, and I swear, near fours, I almost drove into the lock. <laughs> it's 23 miles long, a mile uh, wide at its widest, and the average is 600 feet in depth with two cubic miles of fresh water, the River Ness Outlet, but only five miles long. It's one of the great, greatest in Britain for average flow. 
You can see the uh, remains of Urk, Urkhart or Urkuhart Castle there on the right. We know that it's about 10,000 years old formed uh, when the last glacier receded and the Great Glen was occupied by a huge glacier. It filled the valley. So at its deepest point, the lock is 740 feet deep. And what near foyers that I just mentioned, there's a there's 500 feet of water just 60 feet out from the bank. If you were to swim 60 feet out, it would go down to 500 feet. Incredible. When I was over there in 1997, I'll talk about that later, but uh, it was around the summer solstice and uh, uh, driving around, the, I'd lapped the lock so many times in my car. But it's remarkably flat and smooth with a layer of sediment 25 feet deep. If you were to um, descend in one of those deep sea diving suits, you could you'd penetrate the peat all the way down to the hard clay, which has never been penetrated. And that's why it gives off this, this obscured, murky look because it's easily stirred up. And you can have clear and flat days um, on one side of the lock and then go down lock and it's choppy and murky. So it depends on what the weather is and it can change in an instant. So this beast or this creature may or may not exist. I wish I could be more ambiguous, uh, but it's a, the Scottish word for this is nisiag or nishag. And it's a cryptid that's reputed to inhabit Loch Ness in the Scottish Highlands. A cryptid is an animal that may or may not exist. Cryptozoology is the study of animals that may or may not exist, i.e. a unicorn, a jackalope, Bigfoot, out of place or oop animals like alligators or mountain lions. I believe there are mountain lions in New England, by the way. A cryptozoologist, I, I think the foremost cryptozoologist right now is Lauren Coleman. He's got a great book called Mysterious America. I still recommend it. I call it the Sergeant Pepper of cryptozoology books. Now, could it be a living dinosaur? Uh, the most frequent speculation, it's a long line, a line of long surviving plesiosaurs. And allegedly it was trapped and uh, this type of creature has been seen or allegedly seen in various lakes around the world, including the United States and Canada. A plesiosaur is just a genus of large marine reptile that lived during the early Jurassic period. A small head, a long and slender neck, kind of sounds like me, a broad turtle-like body, yeah, a short tail, I don't have one, two pairs of large elongated paddles. Its scientific description came in 1824 after a complete skeleton was discovered, but it was discovered by Mary Anning in England, December 1823. Some people think it might be an elasmosaurus, which is similar to a plesiosaur, but with a long, long stretched neck, as you can see in the image. It survived or lived in the late Cretaceous period, 80.5 million years ago, 45 feet long, two tons. And in the western interior of North America, in the Great Plains, uh, you can find, that's where they found skeletons. And it was described in March 1868 by Edward Drinker Cope. Uh, from a fossil discovered by Theophilus Turner, a doctor, a military doctor in Western Kansas. But how could a dinosaur survive today? Most scientists think that a surviving remnant of the Mesozoic, uh, Mesozoic era is highly unlikely. They need a large breeding colony. There's have to be a, a food source and they'd have to come to the surface if they're mammals to breathe. And this would result in far more frequent sightings than have actually been reported. And many biologists also argue Loch Ness isn't large enough or productive enough to support even a small family of these creatures, let alone a population, as it was created during glaciation and was frozen solid during recent ice ages. So who knows? We'll look at these photos. That's the McNabb photo. Now, as Robert mentioned, really uh, the popular interest worldwide kicked into gear in 1933. It was a great distraction worldwide during the Global Depression. The United States was undergoing the Dust Bowl in the early stages of the Great Depression as the world was suffering from this. So it was a great distraction. But again, the evidence is ambiguous, disputed personal accounts, encounters in low quality photographs, friends have been made over sightings, enemies have been made, bad names have been called due to alleged sightings. And the scientific community, and I have difficulty understanding what that is today, by the way, uh, is a modern day myth, they claim the Loch Ness Monster. And they say the sightings are hoaxes and wishful thinking. I think that's really degrading to the people that have lived there their entire life that claim to have seen an image. Uh, you're basically calling them liars or they have, uh, they're, they're trying to pull the wool over people's eyes or they have bad eyesight. And I think that's, I believe these people have seen something that might be a disturbance in the water. Uh, some may have seen a hump, don't know. 
but it's been called Nessie. When I was t- uh, driving around, the, the, a woman in the gift shop uh, at Drum the Rocket said, are you going to see the water horse? Yes, I'm going to see the water horse. All right, that's one of three bad Cockney accents I will do for you this morning. These are the descriptions here, top to bottom, the five you'll see. Single hump, multiple humps, neck low in the uh, water, uh, neck in a hump, neck in multiple humps. 20% of the sightings uh, back or body is reported. The most common description, you're going to hear this, is an upturned boat. But two humps are the most commonly reported. And humps appear in no less of 45% of the sightings. And they think that over, and I believe this, 4,000 people have reported seeing this uh, in the last 130 years, 135 years, since 1888. So it's 1,500 years old. The image there on the left, carvings of this unidentified animal made by ancient inhabitants of the Scottish Highlands 1,500 years ago uh, show some sort of strange aquatic creature. The water kelpie, first reported in 565 AD by St. Columba, not Columbia. Uh, He scared off the beast with his staff after it allegedly killed a local man swimming in the loch. And then the written account, which is far too boring for me to read, uh, says that St. Columba took it for a, rode it on its back. Okay, I don't know about that. Anyways, it's, it's the oldest known legend from the water kelpie. And some say the story was told to kids over the last uh, hundreds of years to tell them to be good or the water kelpie will get you. So you can see uh, General Wade's Road. You can see the three locks that I mentioned, Loch Ness in the top, Inverness at the northeast portion, then Drumna Drocket, that's where I stayed. Fort Augustus is at the base of Loch Ness. And then you go around to Foyers. And then there's Loch Lochie and Loch Oik. All have had sightings, alleged sightings of a creature. But this General Wade's Road, uh, they began constructing this around the locks in 1731 for carriages and wagons. And in in 1769, two road builders said that they described two Leviathan creatures, which they believe belonged to the whale family, or they thought they were whales themselves. And then in 1871, in October or 1872, a man by the name of Mackenzie of Balnain saw what he at first thought was an upturned boat until it set off up the lock at great speed, wriggling and churning up the water as it did so. And one thing that amazes me is since 1888, a lot of similar sightings generations apart. So this is uh, one tribal hoax or people are seeing something. In 1880, diver Duncan McDonald was hired to examine a sunken ship off of Fort Augustus at the southwest base of the lock. That's a hoax photo. He was only down there a few minutes when he tugged on on the the line to pull him up. And when he came up, he was terrified. He said he saw a huge beast like a frog sitting on the ledge of a rock underneath the lock. And he never dove in Loch Ness again. A horse with a a mane. In 1885, Roderick Matheson observed a thing moving forward. The biggest thing I ever saw in my life. Neck like a horse with a mane. And that's where the term water horse comes from. In 1888, Alexander McDonald, little McDonald, a crofter from the village of Abriakin, saw a creature 20 feet long, and he said it reminded him of a salamander. It swam within 50 feet of him, and he could see what looked like flippers. 1895, a salmon angler named Forrester, a hotel keeper and fishing warden, so he certainly knew the game in the loch, reported that a horrible great beastie appeared in Loch Ness. And then in 1903, a man by the name of Fraser and two others could not get closer by rowing towards humps that looked like an upturned boat. Again, 1908, John McLeod sees this motionless object that suddenly moves off with a long tapering tail, eel-like head, 30 to 40 feet in length, and the creature was lying in the water flush with the surface. And that's some sightings we'll discuss is, the, the the this creature, this alleged creature, seems to be resting in the water, and then it realizes it's being seen and moves the head and then swims off. May 10th, 1923, 7.30 in the morning. William Miller, David McGilvray, they see something stationary that moved off in an arc and submerged 10 to 12 feet long, and it looked like, you got it, an upturned boat. This is a globster, a, a, an unidentified dove. Uh, marine mammal mass that washes up on various beaches throughout the world. They call them globsters. One, um, I, uh, I called it the Block Ness Monster, uh, washed up on Block Island off of Rhode Island in 1996. 
And then uh, April 23, in 1923, Alfred Cruikshank. He says he sees a creature over three feet long, an arched back, and four elephant-like feet crossed the road before him as he was driving. So this is the first sighting of the Loch Ness Monster on land. There's an entire litany, and we'll look at some, of, of, of encountering the Loch Ness Monster on land. They're my favorite. But you can just see if this were an elephant, what it would look like with the silhouette there with the humps. Other sightings report creatures more similar to camels or horses. Now, that's in the early part of the 20th century, and then they, they mold into the brontosaurus type, uh, plesiosaurus, elasmosaurus type sighting. And then there's um, Alex Campbell. This is a famous sighting, uh, May 2nd, 1923. He's the water bailer for Loch Ness. He was on those old In Search of programs, also a part-time journalist in a report in the Inverness Courier. And uh, that's when the term Loch Ness Monster is first applied to the creature. He's at the mouth of the River Oik. That's the second lock down from Loch Ness. One beautiful morning. And he's gazing across the lock in the direction of Borlem Bay. And that's when his attention is drawn to a strange object that seemed to shoot out of the calm waters almost opposite the Abbey Boathouse. So you have water bailiffs, police officers, fishermen, residents along the lock, all of them in the 20th century seem to either have a story, have a relative who's encountered it, or they know somebody who allegedly has seen this entity. And of course, the tourist faction. But Campbell goes on, he said, it must have heard or sensed the approach of his vehicles because he saw it turn its head in an apprehensive way, this way and that, and apparently being timid, it then sank rapidly out of sight, lowering the neck and doing so, and leaving a considerable disturbance on the mirror-like surface of the lock. Again, the lock can go straight calm like glass. Ten minutes later, there's, there's chop, you know, with two to three foot swells. He said, though, Campbell said it was 400 yards away from where he stood, possibly less, and he had a clear view, which lasted several minutes. And again, what's the motive for this guy to come out and just tell a story like this and be mocked and ridiculed? So just look, referring to the humps the, uh, on the left-hand side, these are the sightings that emerge out of the late 20s. It's 9.30 a.m. on August morning, 1929. Mrs. Cumming and David McGilvery again saw a motionless object that sank with a splash, and it had the hump the size of a horse's body. July 14, 1930, 7.30 a.m., Ian J. Milne. We have a name and a middle initial. He sees a splash that moves in an arc at 16 to 17 miles per hour. That's moving. And then submerged. It had two or three shallow humps undulating. That means moving along its back. Now, this is my favorite uh, odd creature, Colonel Fordyce. Look at this thing. It's uh, he and his wife report seeing a shaggy furred, long legged, long neck camel like creature that crosses a road to get to the lock how did why did the lock this monster cross the road to get to the this bizarre account i'm going to put the this back on the bizarre account came to the public's attention though only recently in 1991 but this is just odd behind you see this is the image of the surgeon's photo we'll get to that in a moment it's uh, 4 p.m. in the afternoon, February 7th, 1932. Uh, remember, in Scotland, the sun stays up a little longer than it does, uh, say, here in the Northeast. James Cameron, not the filmmaker, observes a hump like an upturned boat lie motionless and then sink. And then just before noon, 1933, Mrs. Curtin and P.F. Grant see a, a disturbance that moves about with great speed, disappearing and reappearing 100 yards away. Six foot by one foot hump. The Mackay or McKay sighting, sighting, the first modern sighting. It's three o'clock in the afternoon of April 14th, 1933. These next two years, there's a frenzy of sightings. The newspaper, the Inverness Courier, carries a story on May 2nd of Mr. and Mrs. John Mackay, who reportedly saw an enormous animal rolling and plunging on the surface. The two humps, one was larger than the other, turned in an arc and sank. That's not the photo they took. That's just a random image I took up, which, by the way, is Bogue, which is short for bogus. It was 20 feet in length, though, according to, uh, to the Mackays. In the report of the monster, which was a title chosen by the editor of the Inverness Courier, becomes a media sensation. London newspapers send reporters to Scotland, and a circus ensues, even offering a, war, a reward of £20,000 for capture or proof of the monster. I call this one Shaw's Log. 
It's between 5 and 6 o'clock in the afternoon of May 11th, 1933. Alexander Shaw and Alistair Shaw saw a wake and then a hump moving faster than a rowing boat. It had a hump eight feet in length like a log. And then come the Spicer sightings. Modern interest in the, in the monster is sparked by the July 22nd, 1933 sighting when George Spicer and his wife, remember he's got an eyewitness, and they're subjecting themselves to scrutiny when they come out, they see a most extraordinary form of animal cross the road in front of their car while driving from dories to foyers. They say the creature is, has a body four feet high, 25 feet in length, with a long, narrow neck, slightly thicker than an elephant's trunk, and as long as the 10 to 12 foot width of the road. So now you're starting to get that modern sighting. No camels, no elephants, no weird creatures. Now they're all describing what uh, we could refer to as a plesiosaur-like creature. Uh, but this, this is that's on the right hand side is the depiction of what they saw on the left side is it's all cartooned up. But the neck had a number of undulations in it, but they saw no limbs, perhaps due to the dip in the road obscuring the animal's lower portion. So it lurches across the road towards the lock 20 yards away, leaving only a trail of broken undergrowth in its rate in its wake as it slid back into the lock. By the way, there's two museums. Uh, there was two museums when I was there the official Loch Ness Monster Exhibition Center and the original Loch Ness Monster Museum. And that's a, a creature uh, uh, they have in, in a pond as a mock creature. Anyways, George Spicer, check this out. On the, at the top, you can see that's his original drawing. Is it looks like a blob, um, looks like a polywog uh, on the road. And then there's uh, enhanced on the left-hand side what it might have looked like. Again, that's the picture that Spicer described. Weird. And again, showing what their headlights hit. So it's finally August 4th, 1933. The Inverness Courier publishes this claim by George Spicer, who, along with his wife from London, uh, sees uh, this the nearest approach to a dragon or prehistoric animal that I have ever seen in my life, trundling across the road towards the lock. And he said it was carrying an animal in its mouth as well, like a small rodent. And then A.H. Palmer, uh, at 7 a.m., August 11th, 1933, sees the creature as having its head, which they saw from the front, set low in the water, and its mouth, which had a width of between 12 to 18 inches, was opening and closing. Its maximum mouth aperture was estimated to be about 6 inches. So they actually see this thing, or claim to see this thing, opening its mouth. And then once it's published, uh, the people said, I saw one too. They start writing into the paper. Um, you know, anonymous claims of seeing it either on land or in water. Uh, they saw it, somebody in their family saw it, one of their acquaintances saw it, or they were told about it by one of their relatives. So now national uh, acclaim in the UK and now international acclaim. And again, this is uh, becoming a great distraction. Um, you've got the Great Depression going on in the Dust Bowl, the, the peak of the Dust Bowl in the United States. It's the gangster era, uh, era as well. And you've also got Hitler starting to, uh, to uh, build up his armed forces uh, in Germany. But they, they describe it as a monster fish, a sea serpent, a dragon, uh, settling on the Loch Ness Monster. Again, it's timing. This thing goes viral, as we would say. And my favorite on the road sighting, Arthur Grant. Check that out, okay? He's on a motorcycle. He's 21 years old, 1933. He claims he nearly hits the creature while approaching Abriakin on the northeastern shore about 1 a.m. on a moonlit night. He claimed that he saw a small head attached to a long neck and that the creature saw him and crossed the road back into the lock. That, that's my favorite one. Excuse me, I, I just, just tried to pass by. Would you move out of the way, please? That's his drawing. Pretty cool. And it's white in color. Now, again, what's his motivation? He's a veterinary student. He says it's a hybrid between a seal and he's the first to reference a plesiosaur. He said he dismounted, got off his bike, follows it into the lock only to see ripples in the water. And then sporadic sightings of the creature on land continue until 1963. And then August, it starts to break open. 1933, 2 o'clock, August 5th, Mrs. Miss Nora Smith sees a hump the size of a rowing boat move as if it were circling before it submerged. 
And then 3 p.m. on the same day, Miss P. Keys, R. A. R. Michaelum, and Mrs. Michaelum uh, see a four to six foot hump that moves back and forth before submerging. It was seen end on with a ridge the size of a cart horse. Uh, A.H. Palmer, as I mentioned, 7 a.m. August 11, 1933. This is the one that opens up its mouth, but that also happened in the sequence of August of 33 sightings. And then 2.30 p.m., also in August, Mr. G. McQueen sees a 12 to 14 foot hump moving slightly, causing ripples and then sinking. August 15th, 1933, 2.30 p.m., John Cameron sees a 15-foot-long object moving fast, and this is the first time I could find the reference of a V-shaped ripple. Uh, when we talk about the Dinsdale film, we'll talk about that as well. But it's eight inches above the water, and he said it looks like a floating telegraph pole. August uh, 16th, 1933, 11 in the morning. Mrs. E. Garden Scott saw a hump like an upturned boat that submerged. Late August 1933. This is a great one. And this is a wait till you hear this description. I love genuine, um, innocent, curious, speculative descriptions. I'm going to read it to you in a poor accent, mind you, uh, of, of this next sighting. It's, it's probably one of my favorite descriptions of, of, of encountering the alleged Loch Ness monster. Mrs. Moyers, okay? So you can see her sketch on the right. 9 a.m. August 25th, 1933, Mrs. B. McDonald, Mrs. Sutherland observes a hump moving in an undulating way that left disturbances 20 feet behind it uh, before it finally submerged. And then Mr. W.D. Moyer sees a wash, then a moving hump that suddenly submerges at 7.15 at night on August 26th, 1933. By the way, in June, when I was there at the summer solstice, the sunset was like 10.30 at night. Mrs. J. Simpson, August 22nd, 1933, saw an impression of two flippers that dived, and then 11.30 a.m., same day, Mr. A. Gillies sees a foam disturbance, then a single hump two to three feet out of the water that submerges and then reappears. Same day, three sightings in one day, three note, uh, noted sightings. 12.45 in the afternoon, Miss C. McDonald sees a single hump that was splashing on either side towards the front, moving slowly, leaving a V-shaped ripple. Okay, 2 o'clock, November 10th, 1933, Mrs. C. McRae, Mrs. J. McKinnon see a single hump like an upturned boat, 25 feet by 2 feet that was splashing. And then 9 a.m., November 20th, 1933, Mrs. Ms. Nora Simpson sees a low hump and a small hump measuring 30 feet in length, lying motion motionless before sinking and leaving, again, a V-shaped wash. Now, Malcolm Irvin, everybody's... Uh, descending on the lock, okay, trying to get the first film of it. And Malcolm Irvin, Irvin, along with his associate Stanley Clinton, Scott Hay of Scottish Film Productions, finally film the creature near, near Inverragag, Inver, Inverferagag, and the date's December 12, 1933. All men wanted to capture the monster on film. So let's take a look. Look at the hump towards the back. So it's leaving some sort of a wash there. See some humps. What well, could it could be? Could be anything. Could be a fish. Anyways, uh, everybody's excited about this, and then. Uh, he said, quote, we were so excited and elated when the monster appeared that we had no time to think of steel cameras. It definitely is something with two humps that mm, is much clearer from the picture. And Malcolm Irvin, Ir Irvin describes the object in some detail. He said it traveled around four meters per second and portions of its back were clearly visible. And he went on to describe, as you saw, a trail of foam or wake that the creature formed as it moved through the water. Nobody knows where the original is of this film. That's a copy. So the winter of 33 comes and Mr. Uh, George Jameson sees uh, a 15 to 20 foot, uh, two humps, 15 to 20 feet in length. This is December 27th, 11 a.m., 1933, two by three feet. So 15 to 20 feet long humps 
two by three feet. And it moves across the rock, lock and rapidly dives once he hits the car horn. January 30th, 1934, Howard Carson, 725 AM. Again, sees two humps, two by three feet, 13 feet overall in length, the head and neck moving slowly before leaving a wash before it submerges. This is allegedly the first photograph taken December 6, 1933 by Hugh Gray. It, uh, it, was, uh, it was published December 6th, 1933, but it was taken nearly a month before November 12th. He says he was walking back from church and he sees an object of considerable dimensions making a big splash of spray on the surface of the lock. He had his camera on him. Uh, he snapped several pictures, but only one picture showed anything. Many suggested that it looks like a distorted image of a dog, perhaps his own dog carrying a stick in its mouth as it swims through water. And if he was just coming from church and that's his dog, shame on you. <laughs> R.T. Gold, uh, shortly after the creature received official notice when the Secretary of State, State of Scotland said the police should prevent any attacks on the Loch Ness Monster. First book about the Loch Ness Monster is published by R.T. Gould in 1934. He collects all the personal investigations he made and then he records all additional reports dating the sum, predating the summer of 1933. Uh, good read. I really like this. And he suggested that it looked like something like a long neck newt. And Roy Mackle, uh, the late Roy Mackle from Chicago, uh, he was a cryptozoologist. He sees, he sees it's the same thing. It's a newt or like a, a slug, he thinks, an eel-like person. Mrs. Reed's Harry Hippo. December 1933, she's the wife of the Inver Farragag postmaster. She sees a remarkable hairy hippo-like Loch Ness monster creature on land. She's in her car at the time. The creature is almost six feet long and has a rounded head, a mane, and short, thick legs. And then the London Daily Mail. Check out this highlight. Monster of Loch Ness is not legend, but a fact. December 1933. And now to the surgeon's photograph. There's still a little bit of me trying to hold on to this photograph is authentic. I don't think that'll ever go away. Uh, I guess I'll just muse here. I believe these people see something. I don't think it's a hoax. Could they have been hoaxed by or are misidentification? Perhaps. But there, are a lot, there were a lot of consistent sightings. There are still sightings being reported as we speak in this year, 2021. Uh, not as dramatic, but uh, there are more eyes in the water, more cameras. Uh, so we'll look at that at the end. But anyways, it's October 1933. Now the London newspapers, one-upsmanship, right? Um, you know, if, you, if it's, it's an era, I guess, in, in the early 1930s, especially in, in Britain, one of the phases of fake journalism. And uh, they send correspondence to Scotland. Radio programs are being interrupted. We interrupt this program to bring you a special update from the shores of Loch Ness. Somebody saw something. Now back to your regularly scheduled program. A British circus offered a reward of 20,000 pounds for the capture, as we mentioned. Boy Scouts, outdoorsmen arrived, some venturing out in small boats, others setting up deck chairs and waiting expectantly for the monster to appear. And then in 1930s, a big game hunter named Marmaduke Wetherill. He goes to Loch Ness to look for the Loch Ness monster. He brings a camera, uh, a monkey and its big old gun. Let's look at that again. <laughs> okay. So, fever pitch in December now. London Daily Mail, it's December. Uh, they hire, he's an actor as well. Marmaduke Weatherall is going to track down the beach and he's looking for footprints on the side of the lock because, again, there were so many sightings of the Loch Ness monster crossing the road. And then only after a few days of the lock, he reports uh, finding the fresh footprints of a large four-toed animal. It's estimated to be 20 feet long with great fanfare. He made plaster casts of the footprints and just before Christmas, he sent them off to the Natural History Museum in London for analysis. And again, uh, the museums all just were on holiday. So the world held its breath as legions of monster hunters descended on Loch Ness. They filled up the local hotels. Inverness was floodlit, streetlights for the first time. Traffic jammed the shoreline roads in both directions. Wow, Duke Wetherill had found footprints. So then in January, the zoologists returned from holiday. And they say the footprints are those of a hippopotamus. 
a Loch Ness hippopotamus. They had been made with a stuffed hippo foot, which was the base of an umbrella stand or ashtray owned by Marmaduke Weatherall. Oh, they don't know whether he was the perpetrator of the hoax or its gullible victim. Yeah. Duke. And then, the surgeon's photograph. This is the most important photograph. It's the iconic photograph you see. Just if you were talking about Bigfoot, the something, I think it's frame 365, the Patterson-Gimlin film of Bigfoot taken in October 20th, 1967. This is this comparable mate of the Loch Ness Monster. It's really the only photographic evidence of a, of a defined head and neck. All the others at this point photographically were humps or disturbances. Robert Kenneth Wilson, R.K. Wilson, a London gynecologist near, sees this allegedly near Invermoriston along the lock, and it's published April 21st, 1934 in the London Daily Mail. That's R.K. Wilson. He claimed he was looking at the lock when he saw the monster, so he grabbed his camera and snapped five photographs. After the film was developed, only two exposures were clear. The first photo, this one here, the more publicized one, shows what was claimed to be a small head and back. That, until uh, Alastair Boyd found this photograph, I'll talk about him in a sec, that's the original photo. You always see the crop photo, and if you look up there, you can see the shoreline of the lock. So that gives you a scale. It gives you definition of this original photo. And uh, quite frankly, it looks really, really small. Just And there's so that they've, they've recreated this improve this out i take their findings as fact in terms of the men that have gone down to the lock and put in the scale model of this but that's the original photo uncropped there it is cropped and you can see the ripple effect around the neck so and this is the second photo you ever seen that look at this it seems to be submerging so these are the wilson photos and again, uh, it was difficult to interpret it. Interpret it. There again, there's the uncropped second film, the second. And you can see a shadow, right? And again, remember when they develop black and white photographs, they can bring out the blacks, the darker colors, and this is more dramatic. So it makes the Daily Mail, stuns the world. It was good for kids, though. I got to say, it was good for children. Children were fascinated by this. It was, again, a good distraction. So, um, they called it the surgeon's photograph. And again, the small ripples in the photo fit the size of a circular pattern and of small ripples as opposed to large waves when photographed up close. Remember how I talked about the V-shaped wake? They're seeing circular ripples. As if it's submerged, uh, emerged rather. So then the uncropped image didn't really surface again until the 1990s. And Discovery Channel made a great um, documentary, and you can find all sorts of videos on YouTube, by the way, of Loch Ness Monster. Uh, and they found uh, an uncropped image, and they found a white object was visible in every version of the photo, implying that it was on the negative. Okay. And you can see the shadow of the neck in the water there. And notice the little hump to the right of the uh, neck and head, and then we'll talk about the back there. So. It seems to be the source of ripples in the water, almost as if the object was towed by something, the narrator said. But science cannot rule out it was just a blemish on the negative, the white spot. And I guess he's, he's referring to the white spot towards the right of the uh, head and neck there. But science cannot rule out it was just a blemish on the negative. Uh, full photographic analysis reveals the object was small, only two to three feet long. Hmm. In 1994, 60 years after the surgeon's photo was first published, that's when they come out and say the surgeon's photo was a fake, an elaborate plot to dupe the Daily Mail, the London Daily Mail. Now, behind the story was a former English art teacher, Alastair Boyd. One night at the hotel in Drumna and I got to sit with him for almost an hour, uh, slugging some Guinnesses and talked to him about this. And um, I walked away heartbroken because I believed every word he told me. And also in that same uh, bar, 
there was Adrian Shine. We'll talk about him. Operation Deep Skin at the end. Sipping whiskey. So I was straight. In. And then Robert Rines and Charles Wyckoff from the Applied Academy of Applied Sciences, who I got to go on their boat with. So it was really the pantheon of great Loch Ness explorers were all in this bar one night. Kind of cool. Um, so anyways, Alistair Boyd, he was an avid Loch Ness um, monster. And he and his wife had their own sighting. Okay. He saw something in in the lock in 1979. So that had, uh, had really ignited his interest. So years later, a friend of Boyd's named David Martin discovered an old newspaper clipping in which Ian Wetherill, he's the son of Marmaduke Wetherill, the hippo foot guy, he claimed the surgeon's photo was a hoax. There's Doug and the monkey. Uh, the article had attracted little attention when it was first published in 1975. But Alistair Boyd found a copy of this, this article, and it caught his eye. First, Weatherall said the plot involved a man named Maurice Chambers, the very same man that Dr. Wilson said he had driven up with from London to visit in 1934. Second, Weatherall, the son, mentioned that the surgeon's photograph included the scenery of Loch Ness in the background. And I'll show that to you again. And the familiar Loch Ness, Ness photo only shows us the cropped, enhanced, protruding neck and water around it. Now, Alistair Boyd knew that the original photo had a bit of the far shoreline in the background to give it scale, and he rediscovered the uncropped version in the late 1980s. There it is. Upper left-hand corner, you can see the side of the lock. Okay? And this, i got to tell you that these later, some images uh, ta uh, taken by Robert Rines were enhanced. And he went along with it, which I question the ethics of. It's just my opinion. But anyways, this photo was uh, is the full photo was only published once in 1934. So how could the son, Weatherall's son, known this detail? Either he had a very long memory and saw it in 1934, or the full uncropped surgeon's photo was published only once and then rediscovered by Alistair Boyd 50 years later. So Ian Weatherall died by the time Alistair Boyd and his friend David Martin had read the article, but they tracked down his stepbrother, who was dying in the south of England in his uh, old age. His name was Christian Sperling. Sperling's, I don't like deathbed confessions. That's what ruined the, the Roswell case, okay? But he's on his deathbed, and Alistair uh, explained this to me. And because Duke Weatherall, his reputation was destroyed. He was a laughing stock um, because of this hippo foot scandal. Uh, he decided to get his revenge on the London Daily Mail. He enlisted his son and his stepson, Christian Sperling, in the in the plot. And there it is. They got a toy submarine, okay, 14 inches, a tin sub submarine with a ballast strip, and they made a plastic wood head and neck that they placed atop the submarine. First, Sperling built a model monster by grafting the head onto the conning tower of a toy submarine. Then, Weatherall, Marmaduke, secretly drove his son Ian up to the lock and staged the photograph, taking care to include the actual Loch Ness scenery in the background. And Alistair Boyd said that, uh, that even he thinks that Marmaduke Weatherall may be him ducking down in the car or even donned a disguise so as not to be recognized as he had his, his kids. Uh, hoax this thing. So then Weatherall says, okay, here's the photos. We've taken them. He he persuades his friend, Dr. Wilson. Well, their common friend was Maurice Chambers, but their friend to, to develop this and sell it to the Daily Mail as your own. You can keep the money. And then R.K. Wilson says, well, I will. And they never thought uh, that it would take off like they did. Uh, you know, some words when spoken can't be taken back and, and this hoax could not be walked back. It went worldwide. Richard Smith, an American journalist, uh, notes the story, uh, the toy experts question whether the toy submarines of the 1930s could have actually performed as described. You know, that did they have toy submarines that could actually pull this off? The answer is yes. So, this comes out, Alistair Boyd, he knows this for a few years. He finally releases his findings, and it took him some time, and he was under scrutiny for that. Why did it take you so long, Alistair, to publish your works? But in 1994, he says it's a hoax, okay? And he says the 93-year-old stepson of Marmaduke Weatherall, uh, Christian Sperling, says it, it was a toy submarine. And essentially, the red circle on the left is the conning tower of the toy submarine, the tail fin of the toy submarine is that the blue circle, and of course the neck is circled in green. Looking at that image now, they're saying 
okay, that that's how the photos, the, the photo was hoaxed, is that you see the conning tower and the neck and heads grafted towards the rear of the toy submarine, which implies the toy submarine is not moving uh, to the right, it's moving the opposite direction. And they're thinking that maybe those the, the, the circular ripples is because the toy sub emerged out of the water straight up, just like if you tossed a pebble into a pond. Then Sir Edward Mortimer Mountain, um, he's a the city dealer and chairman of Eagle Star Insurance. Okay, now he finds himself drawn into the mystery. He finances a watch on Loch Ness, you know, trying to get some publicity. 20 men, 10 hours a day from the uh, July 13th through August, and they take 21 pictures of the Loch Ness Monster, and this is the best. All that money and time. Upturned boat, right? By the way, have they ever found upturned boats on the shores of Loch Ness? The answer is yes, but it's a rare occasion because usually they find the body first. Um, in 1934, a girl claims to see the monster on land near Fort Augustus, but she couldn't provide any other details that, other than it was large and that it had a small head on the end of a long neck. This is, and this is Mrs. Moore's, uh, now here comes the bad accent, but I love this description. It's innocent. And to me, there, there's there's a whiff of authenticity to this. But this is Urquhart, or Urquhart Castle on the right-hand side. An October afternoon, 1936, um, she says, One October afternoon, a friend took my sister, mother-in-law, my young daughter, and myself. All right, so there's, there's one, two, three, four, five people that see this. In a little trip by car to Foyers. On the return journey, at a place where the road runs very close to the lock, about three miles from Foyers, my sister suddenly shouted, Look, there's the monster. That's her sketch there, by the way. We all got out of the car and ran to the water's edge. There before us, at a distance of a third of the width of the lock away, was from us this wonderful creature. It was a perfect view as if we if we had a camera, the most convincing picture of the monster ever taken could have been obtained, but alas, we had neither camera or binoculars. It was a perfect setting. There were three distinct humps, a long slender neck ending in a small head, and the overall length appeared to be 30 feet approximately. I could see no details of eyes, mouth, etc., but the outline was all beautifully clear, the three humps, head, and neck. The middle hump was the highest, the one behind the neck was smaller, and the in-between size was at the back, sloping in a graceful line down to and under the water. The creature was quite stationary, and it often dipped its head into the water, either feeding or amusing itself. We watched in awe and amazement for about five to eight minutes, and then suddenly it swung round away from the shore and shot across the lock at a terrific speed, putting up a wash. All the time I could see a small dark spot, perhaps the highest hump, perhaps the head. When it eventually came to rest, I noticed the humps had disappeared. The back was now more or less straightened out, but the neck and head were as before. The creature was in full view for 14 minutes. So, great specifics here. I have no idea how much of the body was underneath the water, but what we saw was a huge creature. Evidently very powerful, graceful, and quite at ease on and in the water. A thrilling experience. I actually saw the Loch Ness Monster resting and traveling at speed. I saw the humps and then the straightened out back. I like that sighting. Just innocent, genuine. I wish I had my camera. There's five of them. They all corroborate this. And it's, it's, they see this thing resting, multiple humps and a neck. And that's her sketch, about 30 feet in length, and then moving away at a tremendous speed. Let's move up to 1952. We're almost concluded here. Uh, Mrs. Greta Finley, uh, she's in Inverness. She's with her small son in the northeast of the shore of the lock near Aldewari Pier off of Tor Point. The monster appears quite literally a few yards away in the water. She says she could have hit it with a pebble if she wanted. That's her sketch. Okay, I was sitting outside the caravan when I heard a continual splashing in the water. After several moments passed and realizing that it was, this was not the usual wash, from a boat, I walked round. To my surprise, I saw what I believed to be the Loch Ness Monster. My son and I stood looking at this creature in amazement. It's got little antennas as well. The McNabb photo. Here we go. 
1955, he's a Scottish banker on holiday, and he's in her Kuhart Castle. You can see that on the right, and then the hump to the left. He sees this large, dark object moving across the bay. Now, he has two different cameras to take pictures of the site, and the images were met with derision, and in disgust, McNabb was so embarrassed he destroyed one of the pictures because of scorn and ridicule. That's an enhanced photo, but that basically, they're bringing out the hump. That's the McNabb photo. Of course, his reputation's ruined. The second picture, and again, this is the second photo. He just destroyed the first. Still in existence. It's estimated, the length is estimated 50 feet. and might have been a picture of the Loch Ness Monster. Torco McLeod, this is a cool one, 1960. Uh, he sees something, a creature trying to climb out the side of the lock, and it's perhaps 60 feet long. Look at this. This is what he saw through his, his binoculars. This long neck creature with films, again, looks like a plesiosaur. He saw it uh, from nine, uh, nine minutes about a mile away, so at the, the widest part of the lock, he sees this. But he says it looks like a large elephant trunk, and the thing is apparently half a short trying to get up this rocky ledge. And it flops back into the water, but without much of a splash. And that's those again. That's the sketch there. And um, then it's been argued that there's no way he could have seen what he claimed to with the binoculars he given his position on the opposite side. So a lot of people say you didn't see this or you misidentified something because you were so far away. Tim Dinsdale, April twenty first, nineteen sixty. He's on a road of upper foyers leading to the foyers hotel. About a kilometer away, he sees an object in the lock. He gets out his binoculars for a closer look. He sees something with strange colorings. So he decides, I'm going to film the creature. And he's got a 16 millimeter Bolex Cine camera, puts it on a tripod, and he sees this object zigzagging its way across the lock. It then it turned left about 300 yards from the opposite shoreline and travels almost parallel to the shore. Now, this was studied by some experts in the, the um, English military, photographic experts, and they said, yes, it's a certain object. They depict that whatever this object, it's operating under its own power. It's not being dragged. Continuing. It's about 1,500 yards away from him, uh, approximately a mile. Uh, this all happens within the space of four minutes, but the film and the camera was running out, so he drove his car down further to lower foyers, then got to the shore and tried to get a closer look at the object. And then uh, when he reached the shore, though, the object had disappeared. But uh, they compared the action of the boat on the lock to the object that Dinsdale filmed, and it's following the same direction at about the same speed as the object had been observed to do so. Uh, the proprietor of the Foyers Hotel agreed to help Dinsdale by using one of his boats, and this was filmed where he saw the creature and where it finally traveled parallel to the shore. Of course, credibility of the existence of the monster grew as the Daily Mirror printed a story on the film on June 13, 1960. And again, this tor Torquil McLeod sighting had just preceded this, so there's another upsurge of sightings uh, in 1960, 26 years after the surgeon's photo. BBC broadcast the film the same day. Let's have a look. Here we go. So you see this hump traveling there on the right-hand side. You'll see a bird fly by in just a moment. And then I'm trying to decide those white objects on the, on the side of the lock, what they are, if there's a person. You know, you can look at this like a Rorschach ink blot. There's a close-up. It's a zoom in. Okay, you'll watch a bird fly by in just a moment. It looks like there's some people, those white dots moving on the on the shoreline there again they look at it there's the bird and they're moving right to left okay so you can see the hump there and just in a short while we're gonna actually see a boat but look at the there's the v-shaped wash okay now it's creating quite a disturbance behind it and there's a boat upper left hand corner for scale comparison and then this type type of foam water or disturbed water i saw something similar to that when i was over there so that's the dinsdale film and uh Dinsdale, Piranha. And then the Academy of Applied Sciences. I was living in Needham in, in the uh, early 1990s, and my neighbor was Charles Wyckoff, and he was a member of the Applied Academy of Applied Sciences. Throughout the 70s, Robert Rines uh, had taken Charles with him. Charles was a high-speed photographic expert uh, from MIT, uh, and uh, he had been one of the pioneers of, of, of uh, undersea water photography, high-speed photography. He had actually um, 
photograph the atomic explosions, etc. Very thing. So he agreed to let me go on his boat because I, I hounded him. Now, they had used all sorts of sonars, automatic cam cameras, and one image allegedly showed the monster floating deep beneath the surface. But I got to tell you, all of their photos since then uh, are subject to scorn and ridicule because they were enhanced by in their books, in other books, in Robert Ryan's, quite frankly, never step forward and say, hey, you doctor my image. So this is the most famous upper left-hand corner. It looks like a plesiosaur. People have argued, is that just a branch, a log, the log nest monster? Okay, so they, they went year after year after year, and then bingo, 1972, they have the flipper film. This was enhanced, it was colorized, allegedly taking uh, something that came very close to the camera with a diamond-shaped film. There it is again, reversed image, colorized. It's hard to say what this was. And there's uh, Ryan's on the left, Charlie Wyckoff on the right. 1975, then comes this, it's the head of the log, Loch Ness Monster. Well, years later, some divers went down for that 1994 documentary in the exact same area, and they confirmed it was a log. So again, I went out there. They, the, this expedition was in uh, the summer solstice, 1997. Dr. Ryan had a theory that, uh, that the chances would be enhanced for them to spot the creature at the summer solstice. And again, uh, the weather for four days was rare, was magnificent at Loch Ness before the rain clouds came, but it was uh, 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 clear skies, sunshine, the loch was glass. And I, I was at a John Cobb memorial. John Cobb, I tried to set the world speed record on a boat in Loch Ness Monster and it was tragically killed. And they have a, a kiosk there, a memorial, and I went there and that's where I saw this disturbance. And um, a Japanese couple came up and they were pointing to it saying, you know, Loch Ness Monster. Um, and a bunch of people pulled their cars over and we watched the disturbance at the surface of the lock. I don't know what it was, but there was something emanating from the bottom. bottom. I don't know if it was some sort of methane emerging from the bottom of the lock, but I took photographs of it. So anyways, Operation Deep Scan. Adrian Shy, 1987, gets 20 sonar equipped boats, a flotilla, and they go from top to bottom, from front to back, uh, north to south, in the lock, scanning with sonar scan. They get three, un they paint three underwater targets that could not be explained and track them for several minutes. And again, I got to, uh, he, I saw him and spoke with him. He looks like Santa in the off season, but uh, he's one of the eminent explorers, funny guy, uh, passionate about the Loch Ness Monster, Adrian Shine. Okay, and then Morag, Loch Morag. There's another loch in Scotland known as Loch Morar, Loch Morar Morar. Some people call it, um, and it's been called Morag, which is a, a Scottish female name. And sightings date back to 1887. 34 incidents as of 1981. Multiple witnesses um, uh, in 1948. A peculiar serpent-like creature about 20 feet long was reported by nine people in the same place of the 1887 sighting. Uh, 1969, Duncan McDonald, William Simpson, and their speedboat. They accidentally think they struck the creature, prompting it to hit back. Here's a photo that emerged um, in uh, 2012, allegedly, of, of Morag. Um, this is the famous photo. McDonald retaliated, of course, uh, when they see something that they couldn't understand, they want to kill it. Uh, anyways, uh, they, they said that they open fire with the rifle. They shoot this thing. It was brown, 25 to 30 feet long with rough skin. It had three humps rising 18 inches above the lock surface, a head a foot wide, 18 inches out of the water. And then this is the, the one of the photographs allegedly taken by Miss Lindsay in 1977. There on the right, it's got its mouth open, two distinct humps, head and neck. It appears to, to be moved several yards. And again, um, uh, Miss Lindsay, petite young woman, I just don't know. How is she going to pull this hoax off unless they did what Weatherall did, hire somebody to hoax it? You know, I hire somebody to hire somebody to hoax it, and then I claim that I saw it. You figure it out. I don't know. Anyways, the Loch Ness Investigation Bureau uh, expanded its search to include Loch Morar in February 1970. There's been evident uh, expeditions there, but just vague photographs. This was taken, uh, another photograph that emerged out of Loch Morar of two humps. 
Now, in the U.S., we have in Canada and North America, we have uh, allegedly a flathead lake monster in Montana, Bessie in Lake Erie, Erie Ogopogo in Canada's Lake Okanagan, Igopogo in Canada's Lake Simcoe in Ontario, Winnipogo allegedly in Canada's Lake Winnipegosis, Manipogo in Canada's Lake Manitoba, and then there's allegedly Champ in Lake Champlain. I highly recommend Alexander Petikoff's uh, Champ documentary. It's the most in-depth look at Champ, I think, in the history of cinema. Uh, of cinema. Um, Memphrey in Vermont's Lake Memphrey Magog. I actually went looking for Memphrey many, many years ago, and I came back with a bad head cold. Okay, so um, I want to just, before we go, uh, I want to see if we can get to, I want to show you some, some current films here. Uh, of the Loch Ness Monster. So here are some, again, some other films allegedly taken, lower left-hand corner of the hump uh, and neck taken. So I guess we're going we're gonna to wrap right there. Uh, I want to thank you so much for staying with me in the Loch Ness Monster. My name is John Horrigan. I will tell you that there are some current sightings that have emerged um, in 2021. Uh, just Google or DuckDuckGo, my preference, uh, Loch Ness Monster Sightings 2021. And you'll see that there was a, a flap that took place and two videos emerged from March of 2021 and one more recently in August. So thanks so much. I'm going to throw it back to Robert. If there's any questions uh, that I can provide uh, vague and ambiguous responses to or evasive answers, I will do that now. Thanks, folks. So John, uh, thank you as always. Wonderful job. Uh, Gail says, thank you. Fascinating and terrific research. Thank you, Gail. Uh, let me see here. Let me open this up. So Manu uh, asked, and this was towards the beginning of the presentation, so I think you covered it, but I'll ask it anyway, just as a refresher. Uh, how big is the Loch Ness Monster? Well, the submarine was two to three inches long, um, but it's it's as far 30 feet. Some people say it, it's big as 50 feet. The highest, the longest description was close to 50 feet. So uh, again, if it's a lead, if it's a real creature, um, it there's different sizes according to their age, I guess, but the, the, the largest I found was 50. Uh, Jennifer says, thank you. Great presentation. Kathy says, thank you. This was a great presentation with lots of informa uh, interesting information. Uh, Mike asks, where did the name Nessie come from? I, I think from the res residents, you know, they just nicknamed it from the Loch Ness Monster first appears. Uh, Actually, it's called a monster, 1923, after the water bale of Alex Campbell. He's in the old in search of, he says, I blinked my eyes once. I blinked my eyes twice, and it was still still there. And they just shortened it up to, to Nessie. But the people, are you going to see the water horse? <laughs> the water kelpie. So it's just a nickname. Uh, Mark asks, hello, I came in late and may have to leave early. Is there a way you can email this week's video you guys are great. I think I may send a donation to the Tewksbury and Clinton libraries. Uh, so Mark, I'll follow up with you. Not, not sure if you're still on the call or not, but uh, to answer that question, uh, just so everyone knows, we upload all of these, almost all of our uh, Zoom programs here at Tewksbury uh, get uploaded to the town's YouTube channel. So if you go to youtube.com and search Tewksbury TV, you wanna select that channel, and uh, most of the paranormal programs that we've hosted over the last six weeks uh, are, are already up there. So definitely check that out. And thank you for any donation. <laughs> it's appreciated. Uh, Gail asks, how do believers explain its long age? And do they think there is more than one through the years? Gail, great question. Um, the, the honest answer is I don't know, but speculating, which I love to do. I... A breeding population again. It's it's speculative. There's no way I think from a science standpoint that uh, uh, generation after generation, as I said, that the sightings began in 1887. They go all the way back hundreds of years. So it, it implies that these uh, the average age of a plesiosaur. I've heard 50 to 120 years. I don't know, um, but for them, they'd have to have a, a viable breeding population. It's just hard to explain. It doesn't make sense. Um, I'll throw a wild card at you right now. So, um, I believe in everything and yet I don't believe in anything, but I always, is this some sort of rip in the fabric of space and time where somehow 
for whatever reason, they're seeing an apparition of an entity that once existed there. <laughs> no, on that acorn. So I, I don't know. I don't. But I do know that these people are genuine. And, uh, and Mrs. Moyer, just reading that sweet account. She's with four people. She's innocent. I wish I had my camera. And she gives this eloquent, magnificent description. They saw something. What they saw, I don't know. Uh, Renee asks, are there ideas as to what this can be if the sightings really happened? Do scientists think such a creature could actually exist? Please tell us some scientific ideas around this. Well, all of the scientific expeditions, um, they have their flaws. I told you about Operation Deep Scan, where they took a flotilla of boats, right, with deep, deep sonar, and they did get some returns. They painted some targets for sure. Uh, some could have been schools of fish, but Adrian told me there was this large creature that they definitively defined. The, the, the Ryan's photographs from Applied Academy of Applied Sciences, they were the most diligent. I mean, their, their expeditions went on for, for, I guess, near 30 years before Charlie passed. But uh, they did everything they could, and they took a scientific approach. Um, and again, the 72 photograph of Flipper Finn, the log, um, they were just reporting what they saw and of course they have the right to enhance their photos so has a yes many many scientific expeditions have been launched and the majority of them have come up with nothing don't know what it is but people are still claiming to see it today tourists from all over the world uh, more eyes are on the lock you know, they go there to stare at the water so they may long enough you, you might just have a i don't know an apparition that's up, up here not on the water it's hard to say, but they're still reporting it. Uh, Lois uh, says, uh, thank you, John. I've been there. Uh, you brought back memories. Uh, Wahid says, uh, great presentation. What do you think about the theory that the sightings might be of a giant sturgeon? They've said that. It just doesn't look like a sturgeon. I mean, Mrs. Moyer's sketch, um, we've heard upturned boat. I mean, we go from a camel to an ele elephant to a water horse. To a giant sturgeon could be i i do believe there are giant sturgeons in there um we talked about the theory of a large slug a newt a salamander uh, an eel but again the descriptions don't look like any other eel or sturgeon sighting in it why would a sturgeon act like that like there's a, a huge lake in russia called lake ba baiklau baiklau where they have all sorts of strange phenomena odd lights odd creatures odd sea creatures supposedly it's bottomless but their theory there is a large sturgeon as well. But it's just, why would a, a large sturgeon only react and show itself in the silhouette in nowhere else? But it, it's a good theory. But uh, Gabriel says, uh, Gabriel asks, have you seen the movie The Water Horse? My kids loved it. Yeah, sweet. It was a cute movie, very cute movie. Um, I liked it as well. You know, it, it was their, their version of Harry and the Hendersons, right? So... Uh, I liked it. it was a cute film. So John, we'll just take a few more questions. Uh, Paul asks, can you please comment on MIT professor Edgerton's underwater flash photos of the fins of the monster? Right. I saw these at a presentation at the Boston Aquarium before uh, or uh, uh, around uh, 18, I'm sorry, I, I can't speak, around 1989. Yeah. Okay, so yes, um, Charlie Wyckoff worked with Dr. Hal Edgerton. Hal was the pioneer of underwater photographer. I think he went over once to the lock, but it was Charlie who took the equipment over. And again, Charlie was a scientist. Um, great background, historical background of taking high speed photography, uh, taking images of nuclear tests, nuclear blasts. Um, he was, uh, you know, he was looking for the science of it all. And I know that in the end, the way he did take offense to the way the uh, photographs were redeveloped, like the Sturgeon's photo, right? They bring out the colors. But uh, what they saw, they, they reported the images they took, okay? One, oh, that looks like a neck, right? That's, that looked like a plesiosaur. Let me see if I can go back to those. Let's just go back to those, just 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 for the, here we go. Okay, so this is the lock, the log nest that they took. It, it, it kind of looks like an eye with two horns on its head, and this is the, the only description aside from um, Greta Finley's of 1952 with two horns. You can almost see an eye. That was definitively uh, proved as a log beneath the, the, uh, the fin photo. 
um, this thing, whatever this is, it, it, it swam very, very close to the, the camera that they, they had dropped down. And again, we're talking about depths of 600 to 700 feet in the lock. This is obviously doctored, two different versions here. And they look, it's the same photo, one's reversed. Um, the one on the right has a more diamond-like shape. This one here, they obviously round it out. And I don't blame Rhines or Wyckoff or Dr. Edgerton. Um, I blame the publishers uh, to enhance these just to sell books. And then, of course, this is the, uh, I'm sorry, let me go, the last one here, the most famous one here. This is the one that always intrigued me is the plesiosaur, right? Uh, that, that it looks like something, again, uh, the, the, they concluded they never found it. It was a stick or a branch. So, so that's my, my thoughts is, uh, you know, they brought over the, the best equipment. Um, and this is the best images that they acquired from the best equipment. And again, I think the publisher took liberties with uh, developing and enhancing the photographs. Uh, Teresa asks, have any paranormal experts investigated this and what were their findings? Yeah, and you need to be careful as uh, paranormal experts, especially, um, you know, I, I, I believe in UFOs. I don't necessarily believe in UFO researchers. I believe in ghosts, but I don't necessarily believe in ghost researchers. So it's, uh, you know, some of them live in a, a, a world of fantasy, embellishment, um, and enhancement in terms of uh, uh, wanting to see something or turning something that's not paranormal into paranormal. So paranormal experts can do that. I like the, the normal uh, Mary and Joe who just take a photo and say, hey, what's this? I, I took it. So, um, and they can speculate all they want. Nobody has found the answer to the Loch Ness Monster, and I don't think nobody will find the answer in our lifetime. There'll always be that small crack in the door that says there's a small percentage of unexplained sightings. That's what paranormal phenomena is. And uh, last question goes to Gail. Uh, thanks, Robert, for all these fun talks yet again for another October of Halloween viewing. Happy Halloween to you. Uh, thank you, Gail. Happy Halloween to you and everyone watching. Uh, and her question is, what drew John to all these paranormal-like tales? Um, I guess strange people like strange things. I've always had an inquiry. Um, I can tell you that um, I believe I have a religious side of me, miracles. And the first thing that really drew me into this was uh, Marian apparitions in the late 1980s. And then in 19... 81 or no i think 83 i read lauren coleman's book uh, mysterious america and just about this bridgewater triangle an alleged anomalous area like the bermuda triangle and then from there they had you know sightings of creatures of alleged bigfoot ufos sea monsters ghosts balls of light so i just went down the rabbit hole and i did all this research during the 1990s um, I was into the X-Files, you know, crush on Scully. Uh, and I, I went to, it took all these videos and I'm just coming out of my archive. Thank God they've survived. And I even allegedly have crashed UFO debris that I, I picked up at the uh, debris field at Roswell. But it's just, I went by down and then in the 1990s, later in the decade, as my professional career emerged, I had to silence this because that would, I didn't want it showing up on the uh, burgeoning internet. And now my career is over so I can start talking about this again. And every time I peel back the carpet of paranormal phenomena, I find lies, hoaxes, and then there's some intriguing tidbits. Well, that's interesting. And you go in to investigate it. So uh, we live in a mysterious world uh, full of mysterious people. All right, John. So John, I think we're going to wrap it there. Uh, you've uh, answered over 10 questions. So I think that's uh, sufficient. And um, do you have any last words for us, John, before we uh, end the call? Yes. Boo. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. There it is, folks. Well, I want to thank everyone uh, so much for joining us this, this morning. Uh, John did a wonderful job, as always, as expected. Uh, look for an email from me tomorrow with a link to a feedback survey, uh, also a link to uh, this recording. And uh, I uh, want to thank all the partnering libraries. I'll do that again uh, via email um, just to save some time here. And uh, yeah, so uh, happy Halloween to everyone. Uh, for those who are local, uh, we are trick-or-treating here at the Tewksbury Library between 9 and 5 today. Uh, but uh, for those out of town, um, you know, uh, it, it, trick or, happy Halloween right back to you. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks so much, John. Have a great one. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.